about all surviving written records from the events of Jesus' life are found either in the New Testament or in the various Gnostic texts. And Jesus is also mentioned in a couple of ancient Jewish and Roman texts. Well, but that's about it, for now anyway. So many think the stories must have been made up. Well, regardless, there is a broad and deep consensus among scholars, no matter what their religious beliefs, that there was indeed a historical character who is called the Christ. And all this despite the fact that physical remains are virtually non-existent. Truth is, there isn't any archaeological evidence directly pointing to Jesus. And are you shaking your head going, what about those various items on display associated with the crucifixion? Again, the truth is, that stuff only makes it suspicious rather than confirming. For instance, the alleged fragments of the cross scattered around the churches of Europe are so numerous that according to what the Protestant theologian John Calvin wrote in 1543, and he said that there are enough of them to fill a ship. Now, I'm old, but I'm not that old. And I remember there in parochial school being offered pieces of wood. Holy mackerel. Yeah, Andy. This happened with the nails that the Romans used as well, which number up to 30. And for the shroud of Tehran, the burial shroud that the body of Jesus was said to have been wrapped in, and it has been revealed to be a medieval counterfeit. It does not correspond to a first century fabric, and Jews of that day didn't wrap their dead in a single piece of cloth in the first place. Now also, according to tradition, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem houses the place of Jesus' burial. And of course, it was discovered and preserved by Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. Now, there are several things within the Synoptic Gospels that try their best to tie Jesus' life and ministry to the Old Testament. They do that by fulfillment of prophecy. And that's because fulfillment of Jewish prophecy was a big deal in the first century Israel. Now, most scholars hold to the Gospels of Mark being the first and oldest in the New Testament. Now, in other words, more think the earliest Gospel is Mark. And it makes no reference to Jesus' birth and begins with him being a grown man. Well, a miraculous birth announced by angels was visited by Magi. Now, don't you think it odd that the writer of Mark knew of all of this but left it out? It seems these stories all developed later and were not included until the writing of the later Gospels of Matthew and Luke, which both used and expanded on Mark's story. All of the traditionally believed details of Jesus' birth come from Matthew and Luke. They speak of the idea that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So, you see, both Matthew and Luke tell stories of his birth, but they don't tell the same story. Now, the truth is, almost nothing can be found in Luke. It can be found in Matthew, and vice versa. And the stories they tell are not only different, they contradict each other. Luke tells how Jesus' parents lived in Nazareth and Galilee and how Mary becomes pregnant, despite being a virgin, by a miracle announced by an angel, and how they travel to Bethlehem for a Roman census, was how Jesus is born there, in a stable. Now, Matthew tells a completely contradictory story. In his version, Jesus' parents live in Bethlehem, and again Mary becomes pregnant miraculously and gives birth in Bethlehem. Herod the Great hears that the Messiah has been born by the Magi, and so tries to kill him by ordering the death of all male children in the town. So Jesus' family escape with him to Egypt. They then don't return to Bethlehem till after Herod's death, because his son is ruling Judea, and they settle in Nazareth in Galilee. It's two different stories. Almost nothing found in Luke's story is found in Matthew's. Much of it's contradictory. Luke's version is set in a specific time during the census of Quinaris, which is held in 67 AD. But Matthew's story involves Herod the Great, who died 10 years before this in 4 BC. Both also contain elements that we find in earlier Old Testament stories, like the birth of a holy man being announced by angels, or a holy man being conceived miraculously by someone who should not be able to conceive, or a holy man almost being killed by a jealous ruler while still a baby. So it's clear. These stories are not historical narratives, but tales that evolved later to signify that Jesus was special and holy, like Samson, Isaac, or Moses, who had similar stories about their birth and their childhood. Now, both the writer of Matthew and the writer of Luke, working close to the same time but unknown to each other, 
drew on stories in the early Christian communities around them to develop the narratives about Jesus' birth that served several theological purposes. And one of these purposes is indicated by one of the few elements found in both the Luke and Matthew narratives is that Jesus was known to be from Nazareth, yet was somehow born in Bethlehem. In the much later Gospel of John, some Jews are depicted as rejecting the idea that Jesus could be the Messiah on the grounds that the Messiah was prophesied to be from Bethlehem. It seems that at least some Jews of the time considered Micah 5 to be the prophecy that said this was where the Messiah was to be from. And John's Gospel seems to be preserving a memory that Jesus was rejected by some because he was from Nazareth. So here we find both the writer of Matthew and Luke presenting explanations as to how someone known to be a Galilean from Nazareth could actually be the Messiah born in Bethlehem. Except they tell two different stories. In Luke, they are from Nazareth originally, but just happened to be in Bethlehem for the census, now when Jesus was born. And in Matthew, they are from Bethlehem originally, but are forced to flee by Herod and to settle in Nazareth. And neither story can be made consistent with the other, and both are clearly not historical, but they solve a theological problem for their writers and their communities. So, the stories about Jesus being born in Bethlehem are clearly later inventions designed to cover off an objection to the fact that he was from Nazareth. It's most likely that this objection was made because he was from Nazareth and was born there, and not Bethlehem. Perhaps there's no way to know. Maybe it comes down to what's true to you. In the Gospel of Thomas, unlike canonical Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, not any of the 114 sayings in the Gospel, directly refer to the event. Thomas' Jesus is a dispenser of wisdom, not the crucified and resurrected God-man. In Thomas, Jesus speaks of the kingdom, and the kingdom is inside of you, and it is outside of you. And when you come to know yourselves, then you will become known, and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, dwell in poverty and it is you who are that poverty they say there is no need whatsoever for a blind belief in vicarious salvation by the way of the death of jesus rather jesus is the savior in the sense of being a spiritual maker of wholeness who cures us of our sickness of ignorance actually the gnostics tended to divide jesus from the christ some said christ descended on jesus at his baptism and left before his death on the cross for Gnosticism, the inherent problem of humanity derives from the misuse of power by the ignorant creator and the resulting entrapment of souls in matter. The Gnostic Jesus alerts us to this and helps rekindle the divine spark within. In the biblical teachings, the problem is ethical. Humans have sinned against the good creator and are guilty before the throne of the universe. In for Gnosticism, the world is bad, but the soul, when freed from its entrapments, are good and returns home. Perhaps physical proof is unattainable. And again, maybe it comes down to what's true to you. And what's true to me is, it seems I've been Gnostic my whole life.